All right, welcome to week four. This week we're going to talk about professional school communication, ethics, and FERPA. These are all very important topics, so thank you for joining me. I'd like to take uh, care of that pretest before we get into the content here. Remember, we are testing what you know before you do the reading, and we'll have a post test after uh, we get through this week's lecture and activities. All right, let's get going on professional school communication. We have about eight objectives this week. First, we'll talk uh, about some vocabulary that we're going to use. Um, then we'll speak about being proactive. We're going to want to talk about communication skills, emails, communicating with parents and children, some do's and don'ts on all of these fronts. Uh, we'll get into social media, what not to post. <clears throat> Next, we'll talk about confidentiality and ethics, uh, as well as ASOP and substitutes, a couple of uh, software packages that um, many districts use. And we will get into our ESSA test prep for the week. All right. These are some of our vocabulary terms for this lecture. Proactive, positive, flexible, as well as Title I schools. To be proactive. If you're proactive, you make things happen instead of waiting for them to happen to you. Active can be defined as doing something. So if you're proactive, you're ready before something happens. The opposite is being reactive or waiting for things to unfold before responding. So if we are proactive, then we certainly get prepared before a class begins and we are better prepared when the unexpected happens. Think about a time when you were proactive. What happened? You can draw on these experiences for your future work as a paraeducator. To be positive, like my blood type. Yes, it's true. Being positive means seeing the best in every situation. It's a good affirmative or constructive quality to have. Can you think of any examples of being positive at work? I bet you can, because I'm sure you do this in your personal life every day. Being flexible. To be flexible means being ready and able to change in order to adapt to different circumstances. We know this happens in the classroom. This is one of the most important characteristics of a successful educator. Can you think of some examples, some situations where you would need to be flexible at work? Throughout this course, we have talked about uh, different situations coming up in the classroom that would require us to be flexible. All right, now let's talk a little bit about Title I schools. Title I Part A of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act as amended, or ESEA, provides financial assistance to local educational agencies and schools with high numbers or high percentages of children from low income families to help ensure that all children meet challenging state academic standards. Title I schools are most schools. All right. <clears throat> Now, let's get into communication. We'll talk about communication in email, communicating with parents, and uh, communication as it pertains to students, para-student communication. Okay, when we're writing emails, there's a certain format to follow, but that is apart from what we're talking about here. The number one thing is, we, is that we want to keep messages clear and brief. We don't want them to be as short as a text message. They're, one, they're about one step more formal than a text message, uh, but they're not like those old paper letters that we used to write, and I still do. We wanna keep messages clear and brief for the sake of our readers, 
who are probably having a busy day just like us, um, and they will appreciate it. Of course, we want to be polite. Being too polite is almost as bad as being not polite enough, right? So we want to be just polite, not super polite. Um, the next one says, don't over communicate by email. And what that means is um, don't rely too heavily on email. Um, if you're working in a classroom with someone, um, you know, maybe talk to them instead of, instead of sending an email. You'd be surprised um, that a number of people choose to communicate via email when they could just talk to someone who's, who's near them. We want to make good use of subject lines. You know, it's like a it's like a book. A book should tell us something about what's going to happen in the book and, and not something else, right? So the title should be related to the, the content. We want to check our tone. Tone should be not just polite, but also respectful. Um, yeah, I think that goes without saying. Um, the last one, oh, for us English teachers, this is a big one, proofread. Please proofread. Um, it doesn't matter if English is your first language or second language. First language English speakers make one type of mistakes. Second language English speakers make other types of mistakes. The point is we all make mistakes. So we need to proofread. If it's a very important email with a large audience or you're talking to an important person, then you might want to have a friend look over your email before you send it. All right. Now we're down to communication with parents and students. Let's consider social media. I'm sorry, I forgot to talk about communicating with parents. Communicating with parents, don't. Okay, that's the, that's the short, that's, that's the short and sweet right there. Um, Essentially, why I say that is that we are not authorized. We're not authorized uh, to communicate any information about any student to the parents, although the parents are, in fact, their parents, and we know that. Uh, it's verified. Um, we are not able to communicate any information about the students. Um, the classroom teacher that you work with will have more to say about this. Uh, you don't have to take my word for it. But as a general rule, when a parent asks us a question about students, if it is a very, very surface level question, it may be appropriate to answer. But anything more than, you know, did she drink her orange juice today um, needs to be sent to the classroom teacher. And again, they will tell you what the parameters are on that. Communicating with students, we have talked a good bit about um, in this series of lectures. Um, and we know that we want to uh, be paying attention to them. We want to use their first names. Um, we want to be genuine when we interact with them because they are human, um, let's say, uh, bull chips detectors, okay? They, can, they will know right away if we are not being sincere. Okay, back to social media. Okay, this is a way that um, it's a sort of one-sided communication. If you have social media accounts that are public, you are communicating with the entire world. And one thing that the world does not do is forget. So when <laughs> I'll tell you the same thing that I tell that I tell my students: nothing is ever deleted. Nothing is ever deleted from the internet. So if you make a mistake, the mistake is there forever. Now that doesn't mean uh, don't use social media, don't post things, don't be afraid, you know, be, be afraid of making mistakes. I don't mean that. Um, I mean that I trust that you all, every single person who hears this has the ability to check themselves before they make those posts. Think before you post, don't take a chance on jeopardizing your job. If you have any doubts, just don't post it. Um, you know, one rule, that some people say is if you don't want your grandmother reading it, don't post it. But this goes this goes even further because you know your grandmother might like to hear about the things that the cute kids do, did during the day at work today. So think about people's privacy. Um, we are we are not allowed to post about other people's children on the internet. 
And let's be intelligent. Don't post or send your resume around from work. Okay, if you are if you are in a position where you are looking for another job while employed, which is the best time to be looking for a job, frankly, um, be sure that your that your job search is being carried out ethically. Use your personal email account, not your work email account. Use your own devices, your phones, etc. Um, and job search carefully if you're currently employed. In the best of, in the best of worlds, <clears throat> your boss would be aware of your job search and be supporting you in searching for your new job. If that's not possible, then the best that you can do is make sure that you don't step on anyone's toes while you're searching for a job. Keep it confidential, and here it means everything. Don't disclose proprietary information about your employer online, either good or bad. Um, if the information is good, if it's good news, you still may want to ask permission to see if you can post it. Many people spend a lot of time uh, grooming their social media, what's the right word, polishing their social media profiles um, with the eyes of uh, trying to see them through the eyes of a potential employer. Go ahead and find me on, on Facebook. My profile is public, but you'll see the, the almost all of the posts are not. Um, I think I have maybe a dozen public posts that you can see. Um, that's, all, that's all done intentionally. And the posts that my friends are able to see are very limited in terms of content. They simply talk about books I've read and uh, places I've gone and stuff like that. You don't want to be, and pictures of me and my cute kids, of course, but uh, we don't want to, uh, we don't want to spill. We don't want to put too much information out there because as I will keep saying, it is never deleted. Okay. There's that famous, that famous photo of, uh, of grandma looking at the laptop screen. Be prepared for the consequences if you post something inappropriate. Chances are that someone will see it and you may be in trouble. So um, I, don't, I don't like to be this cynical, but people say that your enemies spend twice as much time looking at your social media profiles as your friends do. Um, that might be true. You know, There may be someone who um, is just not in your closest circle of friends who um, may not may not be 100% in your corner. So uh, we, look, we want to just make sure to be ready for consequences um, of our actions online. We teach our kids this too, of course. Think before you post, okay? Um, Everybody has gotten, I don't, I'm, I don't want you to feel that I'm lecturing you. That's not my intent. Um, I'm speaking from experience here. You know, everybody has gotten uh, angry or upset and made a, a social media post that they've ret retracted later. Um, thankfully, none of us is, is famous. So we don't um, have any consequences in the media for things we do. Um, you know what happens when someone famous says something they shouldn't and they delete it later. It doesn't matter. Um, everyone has already taken screenshots of it and it's all over the news, right? Um, we usually, you and I usually don't have this kind of coverage, um, but still we need to think about our, um, our close network, our communities when we're posting. All right. Now let's get into a sensitive topic, the topic of confidentiality. We have six main areas we'll talk about. Confidentiality, the top level topic. Uh, professionalism, ethics, chain of responsibility, public relations, and phone and office etiquette. Okay, who needs to practice confidentiality? The short answer is all school employees. All school employees, the custodian the principal, the groundskeepers, the teachers, the paras, the counselors, everybody. Um, administrators, teachers, paras, cafeteria workers, um, everyone is responsible for maintaining confidentiality. Let's talk about a couple of different uh, relevant confidentiality laws and requirements. 
It's the law that all staff collecting or using personally identifiable information in public education institutions must receive training on confidentiality requirements. As a paraeducator um, in any California school district, you will receive such training and you will be paid for this training. Yay. FERPA, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, is essentially our main law covering confidentiality in schools. This was passed in 1974. They updated it in 96. Parents and students over 18 are granted very specific and extensive rights regarding confidential information contained in educational records. So the effect is that parents are given the right to inspect, control to a degree, and to challenge information maintained on their child. Again, under 18. Once you are over 18, it changes. You become the steward of your information over 18. FERPA applies to all schools that receive money from the US Department of Education. So all schools, <laughs> no, most schools. Paraeducators have a commitment to maintain ethical standards of behavior in the relationships with students, parents, their supervisors, supervising teacher, and other school personnel. Teachers have a responsibility to help the paraeducator develop ethical responses to situations that arise. We don't have to guess, okay? We never have to guess. A code of ethics can establish guidelines for appropriate behavior. So this is one of the things that you'll be discussing quite a bit with your classroom teacher at the beginning of a given year. All right, let's talk about a, a code of ethics for paraeducators. Um, something established early in the year. So this is just an example, just a, a, a sample uh, code of ethics. Engage only in non-instructional and instructional activities for which you are qualified or trained. This has been a theme without saying exactly this, this has been a theme throughout our course so far. Do not communicate progress or concerns about students to parents, okay? Imagine, parent comes to you. I'm concerned about Johnny's this. I'm concerned about Janie's that. We need to refer them to the classroom teacher. Um, yeah, that's the safest thing to do. Refer concerns expressed by parents, students, or others to your supervising teacher. Okay, that's the other half of the same coin. We need to recognize that the supervisor has the final responsibility for the instruction and behavior management of children as well. This has been another of our themes, but here it's articulated. Okay, let's talk about the relationship between the paraeducator and the students and the parents. We are only allowed to discuss a child's progress, limitations, uh, perhaps educational program with the supervising teacher and only in the appropriate setting. So coffee shop may be a great place to go and uh, do some grading or decompress, but it's not the right place to talk about student issues. We also need to follow federal and state policies regarding discriminatory, discriminatory practices. Um, these are also things you won't have to guess about. You will be taught. We need to respect the dignity, the privacy, and the individuality of all students, parents, and staff members. And of course, we need to present ourselves as a positive adult role model. I've said before that um, the school children spend the majority of their days with us. So the most exposure, the more exposure they can get to positive role models, the better. We also need to use behavior management strategies, which are consistent with standard, standards established by local school district and prescribed by the classroom teacher. Um, in our previous module on behavior management, we talked about this quite a bit. Okay, what about the relationship with teachers? Getting off on the, on the right foot with your classroom teacher can be a huge benefit to you.
First and foremost, among our responsibilities is that we need to recognize the role of the teacher as our supervisor, uh, that they are. Also, when we, if and when we disagree with the teacher, we need to express differences of opinion only when the students are not present. This uh, presents a united front, a sense of unity is what I mean. We should discuss concerns about the teacher or teaching methods directly with the teacher, uh, not with other paras or with uh, administrators, things like that. If the issues are not resolved through talking with the teacher, then discuss concerns only with the teacher's supervisor. Okay, so your school might have vice principals um, or they might just have a principal. We have a number of schools with no, with no VPs in my district. Um, so the VP would be the teacher's supervisor. In the absence of a VP, it would be the principal. As far as is possible, as much as is possible, we want to establish a positive relationship with all staff members. Any issues that come up with staff members, we need to keep confidential. We want to also follow the behavior and instructional management approach as established by the teacher. We keep coming back to this. It's, it's that important. Well, thank you so much for being here. We have come to the end of the day one lecture of unit four of the paraeducator training course.